Since 2016, astronomers worldwide have been on the hunt, but they're coming up empty-handed. We're talking about the elusive ninth planet, which, according to latest estimates, would weigh in at 5 to 10 times the mass of the Earth. Its highly eccentric orbit supposedly stretches from 400 to 800 astronomical units from the Sun. Just to give you a comparison, Neptune, our farthest planet, hangs out at 30 astronomical units. You probably already know that one astronomical unit equals about 150 million kilometers. Basically, we're looking for a massive white elephant, hearing its trumpets in the distance. But darn it, it refuses to show itself, despite all our theories and high-tech tools. But hold on, there have been some recent developments, and the scientific community is growing more confident that we'll nab this mysterious beast soon. Let's dive into what's been happening lately. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of this tangled tale, let's clear up a fundamental point. On what basis do astronomers dare to suggest the existence of a celestial body they've never laid eyes on? Well, suggesting the existence of a planet without direct observation isn't exactly new in astronomy. You could say this kind of search began on March 13, 1781, when Sir William Herschel spotted Uranus through his telescope. Now, you might wonder what the big deal was, but here's the kicker. In the years that followed, the calculated positions of Uranus in the sky didn't match up with its actual positions. They kept diverging. Some astronomers figured Uranus's orbit had to be gravitationally disturbed by another massive planetary object, lurking even farther out in the solar system. By carefully stunning Uranus's positional discrepancies, the mathematicians of the time hoped they might pinpoint where to look for this mysterious entity. But it wasn't until 1843 that a young British mathematician, John Adams, took the matter seriously. He spent two years crunching numbers to calculate the hypothetical object's orbit and sky position. When it came time to validate his calculations, the real astronomer, Sir Airy, whom Adams consulted, didn't quite trust him and didn't bother checking the sky region Adams pointed out. It was a big blunder because, we can say it now, the actual position of the new planet differed by a mere two degrees from Adams' calculation. So, the discovery of the solar system's eighth planet was delayed by about a year until the night of September 23, 1846, when Professor Gall of the Berlin Observatory, based on calculations independently conducted by French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier, spotted a faint bluish disk, identified as a new planet and given the mythological name Neptune, god of the sea. Was Pluto's discovery a similar story? Well, not quite. In that case, too, astronomers were searching for bodies that couldn't account for supposed imperfections in Neptune's orbit. In 1930, Pluto was found very close to the mathematically calculated position. But then it turned out to be a pure coincidence, as Pluto's mass later proved to be minuscule and unable to perturb Neptune. The discovery of Neptune through mathematics stands out as one of humanity's greatest intellectual triumphs. So it's no wonder that the same method is still applied with absolute confidence in the search for yet unknown objects. Indeed, after Pluto, the pursuit of the invisible continued, and astronomers began to wonder if, even farther out there, there might exist a whole population of similarly sized celestial bodies. And indeed, from 1992 onward, many of these bodies, called TNOs, or trans-Neptunian objects, were spotted in what we now call the Kuiper Belt. Today, we know of nearly 5,000 objects in the Kuiper Belt, but it's estimated that there may be over 100,000 with diameters exceeding 100 kilometers. The dwarf planets Pluto, Sedna, Eris, Makemake, and others are the largest representatives of the category of trans-Neptunian objects in the Kuiper Belt, situated between 30 and 100 astronomical units from the Sun. And it's precisely in the outer Kuiper Belt, through continuous observations, that some objects, 14 to be exact, exhibit decidedly bizarre orbital behaviors. According to what we know about the solar system, these small planetary bodies should have essentially random orbits, independent of each other. However, the orbits of this little group of asteroids seem to share some common characteristics. The most obvious is that their lines of apsides, where the major axis of their orbit lies, 
all point to the same portion of the sky. Moreover, their orbits are arranged on a common orbital plane. To explain these anomalies, in 2016, two American researchers, Konstantin Batichin and Michael Brown, the discoverer of the dwarf planet Eris and ultimately the man who dethroned Pluto from its planet status, hypothesized the presence of another planet in our planetary family, a super-Earth, which, pending its discovery and renaming, was given the temporary nickname Planet Nine. Planet Nine would be a planet with a mass between five and ten times that of Earth, located on a highly eccentric orbit in the extreme trans-Neptunian region between 300 and 1200 astronomical units. It would be precisely Planet Nine with its unexpected presence that puts order in the orbits of the 14 objects in question. An order that, according to the authors of a new study about to be published in the Planetary Science Journal, could be just the result of a statistical accident. The original study by Brown and Batigen considered the orbits of only six extreme trans-Neptunian objects, later increased to 14 in the subsequent years. Since these objects, in addition to being few, are small, weak, very dark, and difficult to spot except on rare fortunate occasions, the authors of the new study warned of possible issues introduced by observational techniques. The greater sensitivity of an observatory in the pointing direction could, according to the authors, lead to selecting objects only in that direction, ignoring the presence of other objects outside of it, thus mistakenly suggesting an accumulation of trans-Neptunian objects in that portion of the sky. It can't be excluded that their distribution is actually uniform across the celestial vault and that the others have simply not been observed. A mere selection effect, therefore. The researchers, led by Kevin Napier of the University of Michigan, then tried to test their hypothesis by analyzing the orbits of another 14 trans-Neptunian objects, different from those in the original Brown and Batigen study, and especially discovered through astronomical observatories scattered in different parts of the globe. It was thus shown that using the discoveries from different observational campaigns, there is no evidence of any kind of accumulation of trans-Neptunian objects, a conclusion that does not exclude the possibility of the existence of Planet Nine, but makes it somewhat less likely. According to Napier, the clustering would therefore be only apparent as a consequence of where, when, and with what instrument we look. However, Batigen disagrees with Napier's conclusions. According to the Russian-American researcher, trans-Neptunian objects have already been searched for in a wide area of the sky around where the bodies in the original study are located, and none of them show the peculiar characteristics of the sample group. Hang on a sec, guys, before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality. The latest attempt to find it at the edges of the solar system was made by a team of researchers using the 6-meter telescope located at 15,700 feet or 5,180 meters altitude in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope, one of the most advanced instruments for cosmology research today. The results of the study were published in December in the Astrophysical Journal. The main goal of this instrument is to observe the sky at microwave wavelengths to study the cosmic microwave background radiation, but its relatively high angular resolution and sensitivity make it suitable not only for the search for galaxy clusters and active galactic nuclei, but also for the search for an object like Planet Nine. A planet so distant would indeed be extremely difficult to detect at optical wavelengths, even with the most powerful telescopes, due to its faint brightness as well as in the infrared. In the past, astronomers tried to detect it using the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, but without success. Since the problem of distance can be circumvented by observing at wavelengths longer than visible light in infrared, such as millimeter or submillimeter wavelengths, currently the only telescopes with a sufficiently high resolution to have some hope of detecting the microwave emission of a faint and unresolved object like Planet Nine are the South Pole Telescope and indeed the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and of these, only the latter covers the low altitudes of the ecliptic where the planet could be hiding. Okay, I agree. The search for a planet in millimeter bands, compared to the conventional observations in optical, which detect sunlight reflected off the planet, 
might seem counterintuitive, but it is motivated by the strong decay of flux density expected with distance, which can be circumvented by observing at longer wavelengths, where thermal emission dominates. The thermal balance of large objects far from the Sun is indeed dominated by their gravitational contraction and residual heat from formation, resulting in a temperature that is approximately independent of their distance from the Sun. And for sufficiently large distances, this can partially compensate for or even exceed the resolution advantage enjoyed by optical instruments compared to those at millimeter or submillimeter wavelengths. Anyway, to search for evidence of the existence of the elusive world, researchers scanned with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope about 87% of the sky accessible from the Southern Hemisphere over six years. Subsequently, they processed the millimeter images obtained with a variety of techniques to identify faint sources whose characteristics reflected those estimated for the planet. What are these characteristics? Well, as a starting point for the analysis conducted, models were based on a certain variety of properties in terms of mass, radius, temperature, and physical composition that the planet could assume. In particular, both mass equal to 5 Earth masses and 1 equal to 10 Earth masses were hypothesized. Furthermore, each of these two main scenarios involved sub-models related to three different values of radius and three corresponding surface temperatures, conditioned by whether the planet was rocky or gaseous. Each of these Planet 9 models is therefore associated with the amount of light energy that the Atacata Cosmology Telescope receives in each of the three observation bands, an amount that varies depending on the distance of the planet and which is expected to be correlated with its mass. It sounds complicated, but it isn't. It's like making many different identikits of an unknown person and then going around asking if anyone recognizes them. The result of the investigations? Nothing. Zero. No trace of Planet 9. The search covered all 18,000 square degrees of sky accessible to the telescope, exploring distances from 300 to 2,000 astronomical units and proper motions up to 6.3 arc minutes per year, producing thousands of raw candidates. A list of the top 10 candidates was eventually drawn up, although none proved to have statistically significant detections. Out of the approximately 3,500 possible raw candidate sources, none could be confirmed, and scientists were able to exclude with a 95% confidence interval the presence of a planet with the properties described above within the examined area, results consistent with other research that has found no evidence of the planet's existence. Disheartening, isn't it? So do we give up? Not at all. Over time, a real scientific dispute has erupted between supporters and opponents of Michael Brown's thesis, and the result is that on alternate days the planet exists and doesn't exist, but still the initial hypothesis has not been shelved. The problem is that unlike what happened with the discovery of Neptune, there is no other large planet near Planet 9 that allows for the detection of gravitational anomalies. All we have are small icy bodies in the Kuiper Belt for which we would expect random orbits on the orbital plane of the solar system. Instead, the orbits of those objects are coherent and supportive of each other, just as if there were a large object conditioning them. This may be only due to chance, but it's not likely. In fact, one of the many new studies that reprocessed the data from the original work concluded that there is only a 0.4 chance that the orbital alignment of the small bodies is not related to the presence of a large planet. And when they recalculated the likely orbit of Planet 9, they were able to pinpoint where to look better, placing Planet 9 closer to the Sun than initially thought. This is strange because if it were closer, we should have found it by now. However, the authors argue that observations have always ruled out the option of a nearby Planet 9, and thus they have always searched further away. Could this really be the reason it has never been found? Okay, this is one of the things we'll find out in the future. Meanwhile, another study, soon to be published in the scientific journal Astrophysical Journal Letters by Konstantin Batagin, Michael Brown, Alessandro Mortabelli, and David Nesvorny, reports the discovery of the most evident statistical clue ever obtained so far regarding the existence of Planet Nine. 
Researchers used new and more detailed computer simulations of the orbits of trans-Neptunian objects, finding that they are in agreement with observed ones only if the existence of a ninth planet beyond Neptune, with a mass five times that of Earth, and distant more than 500 astronomical units from the Sun is assumed. A scenario in which there is no ninth planet in the solar system would be statistically rejected by simulations with high probability. This is not conclusive proof, but a very strong indication supporting its existence. The researchers used a more conventional class of trans-Neptunian objects, those with long orbital periods, in orbits that intersect Neptune's and lie on its same orbital plane. To statistically prove the existence of Planet 9, researchers used so-called n-body numerical simulations. These are computer programs that simulate the behavior of a large number of bodies subject to mutual gravitational attractions. Simulations involve using initial conditions of the bodies that are then left to evolve over time simply by following the orbits outlined by gravitational forces. Nothing new it might seem, but the novelty lies in the fact that this time researchers added to the simulation ingredients not only the Sun and trans-Neptunian objects, but also all the giant gas planets of the solar system, the nearest stars to the Sun, and the effect of galactic tide, namely the tidal force experienced by objects subject to the gravitational field of the Milky Way. Additionally, researchers modeled in simulations the effect of the migration of giant gas planets in the early solar system, and the initial orbit evolution of the Sun in the star cluster from which it was born. In the end, it was deduced that the observed points of conventional trans-Neptunian objects can only be explained if a ninth planet with a mass five times that of Earth and a distance of more than 500 astronomical units from the Sun is added to the simulations. Moreover, all scenarios tested by researchers in which Planet 9 is not added to the solar system lead to the formation of orbits that statistically differ significantly from those observed. With this latest study, it seems that no ingredient has been forgotten to throw into the big cauldron of simulation. And the verdict that emerged is that Planet 9 exists, it's real, and it must be somewhere. Of course, this is just talk without direct observation. In this sense, our greatest hope is placed in the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which will start its observations at the end of 2024, scanning the entire southern sky with a depth never reached before in search of new objects and new unknown astrophysical phenomena. And then, if even Vera Rubin fails, in a couple of years we will have the 39 meter of the extremely large telescope of the ESO, also operational in the Atacama Desert. Within this decade, we will certainly succeed, and the solar system will once again have its historical nine planets.